sometimes things just don't go the way we uh, plan them. And I'm not sure about the speaker back here. It about blew my ear out, I can tell you. And I'm hard of hearing. Uh, I don't know. And I made sure I wasn't the one singing. I didn't want you to hear that. But nonetheless, song we've got to sing from time to time is just a precious song, always will be, always has been, uh, the old rugged cross. And it doesn't matter to me, crank it up, uh, <laughs> let it go, and let's just join together and sing this wonderful song, the old rugged cross. <laughs>
standing, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 15, and we'll be reading verses 13 through 18. Uh, this is uh, scripture that has uh, reference also in the Old Testament. We'll tell you about that a bit later, but uh, for now, this is God's word for us today. Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, said, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. And this is our key verse. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. We thank the Lord for his word, for the reading of it, and the sharing of it. You would be seated if you would. A welcome to you this morning. It is a beautiful day the Lord has given, and we hope that beauty is uh, transferred for you on the inside of the Lord's house as well as on the inside. And more specifically, we hope that beauty is transferred inside of you because uh, this is a wonderful day to know the Lord. Every day is a wonderful day to know the Lord, to walk with Him, to fellowship with Him, to serve Him, and ultimately to look for His coming. And uh, that is what we believe, that He may come today, He may come in this hour. So if you have never trusted the Lord as your Savior, you do that now, you can do that where you are, and you can share that uh, with others at a later time. We do appreciate your presence here this morning, and we want to extend an invitation to others who may be listening by Facebook or YouTube to join us in the Lord's house. Uh, we are making it as safe uh, as possible and we do believe that those who are attending and have been uh, feel a certain level of comfort in being in the house and we just want to let you know that the doors of this church and the hearts of these people are always open for you to come. But until that time, thank you for joining us by Facebook or YouTube. This is an outreach ministry that God has, a door that God has opened uh, through the pandemic. And so we can never say that this time has been wasted because God has done something that may not have happened otherwise. We don't know that, but we're thankful that uh, he has opened that door. Father, thank you today in Jesus' name. It's good to be here in your house, in your presence to worship you and we ask you to lead us that the worship that we offer may be acceptable unto you. And we know that it all begins with the heart. And so we ask you now just to search our hearts and remove anything that would hinder the blessing that the Lord has provided, prepared for us today. And Lord, above all things, our prayer is that anyone who doesn't know Christ as their Savior will make that decision today at the appointed time. They can do that now. And we just thank you, Lord, that this is the acceptable time. This is the acceptable hour. And the Lord is speaking, the Lord is reaching, and the Lord is inviting anyone and everyone who's never trusted him to come and to their hearts, how he wants to do that. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. One of the things that I have been looking forward to, and it seems like we're gradually getting that point. We're not there yet. It's the day when the sanctuary choir will be at full strength. 
Uh, we are thankful for those who have made the commitment and, and have uh, just been a part of our worship service uh, as the Lord has led. And we welcome them now as they come to share their message in song.
we could go back about 25 years, oh boy, if we could go back about 25 years. And during that time, if you were to attend the church of uh, whatever denomination, if you were familiar with that particular denomination, had been attending for some time, you would probably know what the order of service was going to be. It just did not change. It doesn't matter if you went into Baptist churches, the order of service was basically the same. This was true of all denominations. That is not necessarily true anymore. And it's interesting because there are churches today, obviously, that aren't even associated with a denomination. And so when you attend a worship service, you really have no way of knowing what to expect as far as the order of service. And I can tell you that through the years, uh, I thought about changing the order of service, and I guess we have done that. But the order, changing the order of service doesn't necessarily guarantee a more spiritual service. God is more concerned about substance than he is about style. And make no mistake about it, we give attention to detail in preparing our services of worship each Lord's Day. And I guess the big question would be, well, what would God want if he were attending service? Well, first of all, if he's not here, I don't want to be either. And so surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. He is here today. He's here every Sunday. And we're just honored guests to be able to come and to worship him. And so in answer to that question, I have to go to the scripture this morning that says, and it is recorded in Amos chapter 9 and verse 11, that I will rebuild, I will restore the tabernacle of David. Why in the world would he want to do that? If he was going to restore something, why would he not restore the tabernacle of Moses? He was the one who designed it, and it was built to his specification, and it served the purpose for their journey through the wilderness. Uh, better yet, why would he not rebuild the temple of Solomon? That would have, there would be, by today's standard, a billion-dollar project. And so we all understand what a beautiful building the Temple of Solomon really was. But God didn't seem to really be partial to either one of those. The Lord said, I'm going to restore, I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, which tells me that God didn't build it in the first place because anything that God builds is not going to fall down. And whatever he puts up stays up. And so he says, I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of David. In order to understand why the Lord would say that, we have to know something about the history of the tabernacle of David. After the Ark of the Covenant wound up in Shiloh and it was there and nobody seemed to be really concerned about it, but David was concerned about it. And David said, you know, the Ark of the Covenant really belongs in Jerusalem. It belongs in Mount Zion. And he took it upon himself to make the plans in order to move that to Jerusalem. It would have been a distance about 10 to 15 miles, and so really did not seem like a very big deal, but it turned out to be a very big deal. Make no mistake about it. Anytime you are doing anything for God or with anything that belongs to God, it is a very big deal. You don't regard anything lightly, and David learned that lesson the hard way. We'll tell you about that in just a moment, too. The Ark of the Covenant was a gold-covered chest. It was uh, approximately four feet long, two and a half feet high and two and a half feet wide. It had a gold-covered cherubim on each end. They were facing each other. 
And the area in between was called the mercy seat. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant were artifacts from their journeys through the wilderness. And make no mistake about it, being gold covered, it was one heavy little object. And so David being a practical man and deciding, you know, we're going to move this. The best way to do it is the easy way to do it. Human nature tells you that. We're still doing that today with anything. We want to figure out the easiest way. But where God is concerned, the easiest way is not always the spiritual way. We must be very careful about that. And so David has plans to build a brand new cart to haul that Ark of the Covenant the 10 or 15 miles into Jerusalem. And how proud he must have been when that cart was finished and the Ark was placed in its proper place and the oxen were hooked to the cart and off they go. And there is a man, there are two of them on the, in the driver's seat. One of them is a man by the name of Uzzah. And they apparently have not gone very far before one of the oxen stumbles. And Musa believes that the ark is in danger of the cart. And he did what human nature would lead you to do. He reached out his hand to catch the ark of the covenant. Big mistake. Deadly mistake. It should never have done that. First of all, it should never have been on the cart to start with. By design, it was God's plan for that ark from the time it had been built to be carried on the shoulders of men. And so when we are engaged in our planning of our worship, be very careful that we don't dismiss God's plan and God's way of doing something. But back to that in just a moment. And so... David realizes this is serious business. I have made a serious mistake and we had better take time to think this thing over. And so the Ark of the Covenant stays in the house of a man by the name of Obed-Edom for three months. And during this time, I got to know that David was thinking in his mind, what are we going to do, what to do, what to do? And he shouldn't have had any problem figuring that out because during that time, the house of Obed was blessed tremendously. Why wouldn't it be? Anywhere the presence of, the God, presence of God is present, then you're going to have the blessings of God. And so they decide to take the journey the rest of the way into Jerusalem. Doesn't seem to be any big deal. Doesn't seem to be that hard. But it's going to be hard. You see, the Ark of the Covenant had gold rings on the side. It was carried by staves on each side that were gold-covered staves. Everything about it was cold. This thing was heavy. Make no mistake about it. In the last year, the first time that maybe I can ever remember, I served as a pallbearer. And I have a new appreciation for people who serve as pallbearers. I was the youngest one in the group. Does that tell you anything? And we were bringing this casket down a flight of steps that in front of the church that was very steep. And I'm on the front end, and I think the rest of them were just pushing it on down. And I can tell you, when we got that in the cask, in the hearse, I breathed a sigh of relief. I thought, we are not going to make it. I say, God bless anybody who carries that kind of weight. These men were carrying that kind of weight, and they were carrying it on their shoulders. And so they do something that's really unusual. They start their journey, and they go, what the scripture says, is six paces Apparently, what I have figured is that was a distance of about 27 feet. And they stop. And they offer a sacrifice. 
And all of the time, they are singing and celebrating around the Ark of the Covenant. Imagine doing a journey, 10 to 15 miles, covering 27 feet at a time, stopping, offering a sacrifice, 27 more feet. And the interesting thing is that when they stopped, they offered an oxen as a sacrifice. I guess they wanted to be sure that nobody made a mistake. You see, the oxen at that point was a sign of strength and power and wealth. And God wanted to be sure that those people understood doing his business wasn't going to be dependent on strength or power or wealth. He was looking to human beings. And so on they went. They covered that 15 miles over a period of time. And from what we understand along the way, David had been dancing around the ark and no doubt so were some of the others. And that was okay. And so they eventually arrived at Jerusalem. And when they put that Ark of the Covenant down for one last time, David builds a tent. And it is called the Tabernacle of David. But in truth, it was more of a teepee than it was a tabernacle. It was simply a tarp or canvas stretched around some poles. And God says, I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of David. God, you've got to be kidding. Not the tabernacle of Moses, not the temple of Solomon. You're going to rebuild the tabernacle of David? Why would you do that? For a very obvious reason. The tabernacle had a curtain around the outside of it 15 feet high. Nobody was going to see over, under, or through it. That was the point of it. And in Solomon's temple, there was the outer court, the court of the Gentiles, there was the holy place, and then there was the holy of holies. And by the way, keep this in mind. Remember I said to you, surely you haven't forgotten already, Remember I said to you that on the Ark of the Covenant there were a cherubim, gold-covered, angelic being facing each other. In between those there was what was described as a blue flame. It really represented the Shekinah glory, the glory of God. And when they put that Ark of the Covenant in David's tabernacle, David's tent, call it what you want to, they could see by night that blue flame. And the reason God preferred the tabernacle of David was because he never liked anything that separated. And in the tabernacle of Moses, nobody could see in, nobody could see over it. In Solomon's temple, you've got the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies, which, by the way, the high priest went into one time a year. And God never liked that. He never liked that. He never liked anything that separated. He designed it. It was built according to his specification. But make no mistake about it. You know this. When the Lord was crucified on Calvary, one of the first things that happened was the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom, from heaven to earth, and it has never been repaired, and it never will be. God said, I am tired of anything that separates anybody from me. And he made sure that the way to him was accessible to all people. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so when they got to Jerusalem, David builds this tabernacle, if you want to call it that, more specifically a tent. And listen, David loved to sing songs. He was a musician at heart. 
he would have been in the choir in a minute. Make no mistake about it. He would have signed up on the spot. David loved music. No question about it. And around that Ark of the Covenant, they had the singers because I'm sure by the time they arrived in Jerusalem, the poor souls who had been responsible, the Levites, who were responsible for carrying that ark, put that thing down and they said, thank God we have finally arrived. Well, wouldn't you know it, there's joy all over the place because the ark of the covenant has arrived in Jerusalem and David just cannot constrain himself. He just cannot contain himself. He has to dance around the Ark of the Covenant. And the interesting thing is, we have to believe that this wasn't David's first time to dance. Apparently he had done that long before they arrived in Jerusalem. But now he is delighted that the, pep, that the Ark of the Covenant is in its place and he has built a tent, a tabernacle, to the best of his ability. And God is pleased with that, by the way. God is satisfied with that. And so the scripture says that David is dancing around the ark. And up in the second story, up in the second floor, his wife is watching all of this. Now you've got to understand, there are different personalities. You do know that by now, don't you? People, some are just giddy. Some are just, just excited about everything. You can, they're happy that they do anything. They have no reservations about showing their emotions whatsoever. There are others that are straightly. They are not going to get a smile out of them. You're not going to get an amen out of them. You're not going to get anything out of them. They, and apparently, she fit in that crowd. She's up in the window, and she's watching her husband basically in her mind, make a fool out of himself. But David would say, if I'm going to be a fool, as Apostle Paul said, I'm a fool for the Lord. And that's okay. If you want to be a fool for the Lord, you go right ahead, have at it. And she's watching. And in due time, she comes down, and she gets in a conversation. Well, it wasn't really a conversation. She just lets him have it. She said, shame on you dancing like that in front of all these handmaids, all these young girls, making a spectacle out of yourself. And I have to tell you, this is not going to go good. This is not going good. Between a man and his wife, this conversation is not, has got trouble written all over it. And so David says, you know what? I'm not embarrassing anybody, except you maybe. I am going to keep doing what I'm doing as a matter of fact, basically what he said, you haven't seen anything yet. You wait till I really get happy. I'm going to crank it up and I'm going to let it go. And it's interesting because I don't know why God just puts things in the Bible. He has his reason for doing it. But he said that David's wife never had any children. No kidding. Would you think somebody with a temperament or personality like that is ever going to have any children? God forbid that would ever happen. But that's another sermon. Make no mistake about it. David is so happy about this. What I want to tell you this morning is that when we talk about the order of service, we can change the order of service. We can do everything in our power as a human being to make the worship service as meaningful as it can be. But the reason God liked and preferred and would rebuild the tabernacle of David was because it was possible, especially at night and maybe even in the daytime, for somebody to get a glimpse of that blue flame, to see the Shekinah glory. And God today is satisfied with any service where the glory of God is revealed and people know that they are in the presence of a holy God. And so, let me tell you, this is how we worship. We make preparation. The music part of our service each week is totally in the hands of God. It is all in the hands of God. He leads and He prepares, and songs for the most part are planned weeks ahead of time. 
But in the final analysis, it is God who brings it all together. I want to tell you the sermon, it is said the pastor, the preacher, should never ask, what am I going to preach this Sunday? He should ask, which one am I going to preach this Sunday? He'd better have a boatload of sermons ready to go. And make no mistake about it, when it comes time for the sermon preparation, all I can tell you is God has a way of bringing it all together. And I may find something and remember something I've read in a book here or commentary there or scripture here and just leave it in the hands of the Lord. And I don't really do much in the way of preparation until about Tuesday. Monday is not my thinking day. I'll tell you that straight up. And I will tell you that throughout the week, you just pray with the pastor. You pray with each other that God will be glorified, that when people come into this service, they will know they are in the presence of a holy God. You've got to make preparation. But let me tell you, all of the preparation are not on the responsibility of the pastor or the music director. Each and every person who comes into the sanctuary is responsible for making preparation to meet your living God and to know that you had a personal encounter. First of all, the Lord said in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 that if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother has got something against you, you leave that gift and you go and be reconciled to your brother and then you come and offer the gift. What I'm telling you this morning is simply scriptural based. If you've got something in your heart that is not pleasing to the Lord, check it at the door. Check your attitude at the door. Better yet, check it at the altar. And I would want to say, when you check it at the door, you can pick it up at the end of the service. But I've got a better idea. Bring it to the altar and leave it there. Let your heart change and you won't worry about that when you go out of here. You come in here this morning with a heart full of words. You're worried. You don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen. We never have. Every day is a new day and we live by the grace of God. But we come in here and we have to believe that nothing has changed on the outside since we got here. I dare say that. But it's not a matter that something has changed on the outside. It is a matter that something has changed on the inside. And if it hasn't, it doesn't matter what's going on out there. You're no match for it. And if you have, it doesn't matter what's going on because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so you have preparation. You have a responsibility. And I remember the woman at the well saying to the Lord one day, you know, this thing about, well, where should we worship? Where do you say we should worship? He said, I'm telling you, the day will come. It's not going to matter where you are because the Father is looking for people who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Let me explain to you what that means because it may change this hour for you tremendously. First of all, when you worship God in spirit, you know that you are not bound by legalism. The Lord had enough of that. He really did. The Lord had enough of that. The Pharisees, everything was do this, don't do that. You can't have this, you can't have that. You can't go here, you can't go there. On and on it went. Legalism, legalism, legalism. The Lord said, I'm looking for people who will worship me, not according to the do's and the don'ts, but in spirit, in your heart. Worship me from your heart. I want you to worship me in spirit and in truth. And they asked the Lord one day, what is truth? Well, you're looking right at him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. And so to you this morning who have come, you've taken a major step in doing what you need to do as far as worship. But make no mistake about it, being here doesn't necessarily guarantee 
that you are going to have a meaningful worship experience. I will tell you that every Sunday I leave here, I wonder, is there something more I could have done? Is there something more the church could have done to provide a more meaningful worship service? All I can tell you is there probably is. There probably is something more I could have done. Maybe there's something about the sermon. Maybe there's something about the service. But I really want to believe that when we leave here each and every week, we have left it all. We have given everything we have to the Lord. And if you do that, I'll just tell you straight up, I'm not very good company on Sunday. Perhaps you're not very good company any time. No, I'm not very good company on Sunday, and I'll tell you why. Once this service is over, I'm done. I'm spent. My day began very early this morning. And I don't understand, and I can't explain the energy that goes into preaching and preparation. All I can tell you is, if you tell me anything on Sunday, I'm not responsible for anything you said. You better call me back on Monday and tell me what you said on Sunday. I don't remember who's got the gallstones and who's got the kidney stones. You're going to wind up with somebody else's stones you don't watch. You've got, you got, you got to call me up and get, make sure that I got this thing straight. I'm getting as serious as I can be on Mondays. I don't re- thinking about uh, who, did, who, who said that. What did they say? They told me something. I understand it's the convenient time for you to tell me something. It just is. And we are all about convenience. But all I'm telling you is you can tell me whatever you want, but I'm not responsible for anything you tell me on Sunday, except you're going to give me money. Now, if you're going to tell me that, I'll remember that. But other than that, but no, just kidding, just kidding. I want to tell you, worship is so important. Worship is absolutely so important. It is so crucial. It is so critical to each and every one of us. And God bless you. You put forth the effort to come this far and to be a part of this service. You deserve the best that you can get. And the best that you can get is David's tabernacle. When you look in there and you can see the glory of God, when you come in here, you can see the glory of God because I'm telling you, God isn't turned on by what turns on men. And it's not going to make any difference about your style of music. It is going to be about your substance, about your heart. And it is going to be, if God wouldn't know for some services, whether it's a worship service or a rock concert, That's just the way it is. That's just where we are in our present time. Somehow we feel like if we can work people into an emotional frenzy, it's going to help them. Well, let me tell you about that emotional frenzy. I can work you into an emotional frenzy. If I want to do it, I can get you down to this altar. We will sing just as I am until you just a bone out. And as Grady Nutt said, well, I can get you down to the altar and I can work you into a frenzy, and you can go out here and run all the way home. By the time you get there, you don't know why you're running. You know, what's this all about anyway? That's not what it's all about. It's about knowing that your heart has been changed. It's about knowing that you've got peace, you've got hope, you've got calm in your life, and you know that it is well with my soul. You know that whatever happens, God assumes full responsibility. You know that my life and times are in his hands. More than that you cannot ask. Higher than that you cannot go. And so I just want you to know when you come into this sanctuary every Sunday, you're coming into a sanctuary where the music director, where the pastor, and where a host of other people have dedicated themselves to preparing to lead you in the most meaningful worship time you can possibly have. Sure, we can go away feeling like we could have done better, should have done this, should have done that, but all of that serves no purpose except to go back and to be resolved that when we come together the next time, we're going to give our best to the Master. And I'm telling you, our best is all He asks. When we give our best to the Master, you can't, He doesn't ask more than that, and we shouldn't ask more than that. And God knows our heart. God knows our heart. We could always do something different. We could always sing another hymn. We're always thinking about the music every Sunday, the songs that we hope will reinforce the message from the scripture and the sermon. 
We're always trusting God to bring it all together. Lord, what do you want us to sing? And make no mistake about it. Even we who are responsible for leading the church in worship don't always realize until after the fact, wow, God put that together. Why are we surprised? Why are we surprised? Of course he did. That's what he does. That's what he does. Then he said, I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of David. It was just an old tent. It was an old tarp wrapped around sticks. But it did not separate anybody from seeing the glory of God. And so this morning, if you really want to know what this service has meant to you, the question is, have you met the Lord? Have you had a personal encounter? Because I close with this. My prayer every Sunday, above all prayers, obviously, first of all, it would be for anyone who does not know the Lord to trust the Lord as their Savior. That will always be first and foremost. But it is a part of my prayer that there will be a demonstration of God's power in this service. That there will be a demonstration of God's power in every service. That God will do something that wasn't in the bulletin, that nobody knew anything about it, and that nobody can take the credit for what happened. And so, say, Pastor, how are you going to know if that happens? I'm not. I'm not. And you may not. Name it today. But I've had times when people have come back a month or two months later and said to me, Pastor, you remember that sermon you preached a month ago? I don't remember what I had breakfast this morning, let alone the sermon I preached a month ago. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. What about it? I just want to tell you how God used that. And I think, you've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. That's what I'm talking about. For God to do something that nobody knew anything about. It might not happen today. It might not happen in this service all the rest of the day. But somewhere this week, something that happened in this service is going to make a difference in your life. It's going to change your heart. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you are not as stubborn about it as you were when you got here. And if you're listening by Facebook or YouTube right now, I pray that God's Spirit is convicting you. He's getting after you. He's getting all over you. And you will not and cannot have a moment of peace until you give your heart to Jesus Christ. And then, and only then, will you know that this is the way we worship, in spirit and in truth. Ask our worship leaders to come as we prepare for our invitation. And that invitation this morning is another one of the beautiful old songs. That, by the way, there are churches today that probably wouldn't sing this song when the roll is coming up. They probably wouldn't sing the old rugged cross. But we'll sing there, we'll sing new songs, old songs, anywhere in between. We'll sing it all, all along. I have to share something with you that, as an introduction to the invitation, that is somewhat humorous, at least for me it is. And uh, traveling on the roads, you see signs all the time. There are signs everywhere. I couldn't help but notice one the other day, and I... Uh, it's on a billboard, so you wouldn't miss it either if you went by it. And this is what the song, this is what the sign says. It was advertising a uh, medical facility. And it said, we can cure your pain in the neck. I looked at that, and I thought, I didn't look at Carol. I didn't look at Carol. I looked at the sort of the sign, and I think I did mumble to something to myself, and she said, you say something? And I was just talking to myself. She said, well, I saw you pointing your finger. I said, I just I pay no attention to that. And, uh, but when I read, saw that sign that says, we can cure your pain in the neck, I thought, okay, 
I'll load them all up and bring them to you. <laughs> and I'll start with my sisters. They're always picking on me, so we take, get them first. And then I can't bring them all in one load, but I'll make two trips. So you work on the first group while I go back and get the others. But I want to tell you what, there is, if you think that somebody's going to cure your pain in the neck, uh, if that pain in the neck happens to be somebody else, it's probably not going to happen. But I can tell you this. I do know somebody that can cure every pain you have. Jesus Christ is the great physician. He might not make you pain-free physically, but he will give you peace in the midst of the storm. He will give you grace to bear whatever pain you now have. And it may just be something that really has nothing to do with the physical part of it anyway. It's just something you're dealing with in your life right now that is painful. And it hurts. And God knows it hurts. And he is the comforter. He said, I'll send the comforter. He will come and he will go along beside you. He'll be in your heart. He will carry you. There will be times when there's one set of footprints in the sand. That's when he will be carrying you. Jesus Christ can take care of the pains that you have. And many of them, believe me, are not the physical type either. They are the kinds that we can't solve, things that we can't do anything about. You're hurting, and you're, you're hurting from the inside out. And for the most part, maybe nobody else would know what's going on and the pain that you're feeling in your life because we're good, are we not, as human beings, to put them up the front smiling and pretending that it, all is okay, all is well with our soul. The truth, you know, it really is not. And all the time we're thinking, if you only knew, if you only knew what I'm feeling in my heart. But I'm telling you this, the answer, at least in part, is to keep your eyes on the Lord. Take them off the problem, keep your eyes on the Lord. We've got to keep our eyes on the Lord. Keep our eyes on that blue flame. Be watching. You can see it. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And it doesn't stay here. It will be wherever you are. Because Jesus will be wherever you are. And where, there, where he is, there is his glory. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And so I'm keeping my eyes on the skies. I'm keeping my eyes on the Lord. And until he comes... I'm going to do what I need to do to lead this church in a meaningful worship experience. God bless you this morning as we worship together, as we sing, when the roll is called up yonder.
It's just a blessing to us to hear the people of the Lord sing praises unto Him. And our prayer today is that it would be even more beautiful to the ears of our Lord because we're singing praises unto the Lord. Father, we are thanking you today that we have the privilege of coming together and just being a part of the church family and more important, being a part of God's family and knowing that you promised to meet us here in a special way. And we give ourselves in spirit and in strength to worship the Lord and to be sure, Father, that whatever we have done on any given Sunday is the best that we as a human being can give. And we know that God will honor that. God will use that. And after all, He is the one that makes the difference in and through it all. In His name we pray. Amen. repeat the sermon topic this is how we worship this is how we worship amen, amen. 